Hello everyone, it is currently January 24th, 2010, and this is Day 9 Daily number 54. Oh, I keep loving how big those numbers are. Because it was not long ago when I was doing Day number or day 9 Daily number like 10, like 15 and stuff, but uh, now we're at 54, that's so awesome. And because of this genius thing that someone uh, suggested I do, watch this. For any of you who are watching the chat live, we are watching Jangbi versus Haya on Moonglaive. And see, I can clear the chat, I leave it right up there, so that way if anyone tunes in late, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Let's think about that while I eat some tea. Mmm. I love eating tea, I stick by my word choice there. So, um, I think before I do anything, I have to talk a little bit about the uh, NBC Star League Finals. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of people asking me to do a cast of the third game, or to, you know, say who was at the advantage and that sort of thing. So for those of you who don't know, um, Jadong and Flash were playing in this epic finals match, right? It's like everything that anyone had ever wanted. But NBC was consistently fucking up, right? Doing everything wrong. So first of all, they had a studio that had at most 700 people there. <laughs> like, what are they thinking? Um, 300 of which are reserved for the fans, so there's only like 400 people who can actually... Um, or let me try it again. 300 are reserved for the friends and family of the players, and there's only 400 spots for fans, so it's already, like, screwing them over. And they say, hey, we're not actually going to have the players there. We're going to have them in a virtual studio 10 minutes away. Yeah. Which is which is obviously stupid, right? Because when you win your huge title, you know, if you're Jadong or Flash and you beat the other guy, you stand up in an empty room and you go, oh, I'm the champ. Neat, right? You don't get to, like, rip your headphones off in some emotional display and run down the stage and have your family embrace you and be like, oh, I'm the best nerd in the world. No, you just kind of get to sit there and kind of go, huh, uh, did it, nice. And you shake your opponent's hand, oh, nice games, yeah, neat. Um, so everyone was, you know, doing the big eye roll at NBC. But then they lost power in the third game. For some reason, this fancy-schmancy virtual studio that they set up um, did not have a proper power adapter hookup. They, they basically did some hack to get it to function properly and said, oh, that seems stable. And, of course, it collapsed uh, in game three, which is probably one of the best games of StarCraft I've ever seen. So I think rather than discuss who is winning or who is at the advantage, I think everyone should just take all their passion and energy towards it and direct it at NBC. Do what I did and send them an angry letter saying that they are, you know, ruining the experience of competitive gaming for the foreign community. They're completely demeaning esports or treating it, you know, like some garbage event. I mean, it was really annoying that even in uh, Jadong vs. Call, um, they did this overlay when Jadong was winning of Flash, like with a fist, like, oh, I will meet you in the finals, Jadong, like it's WWF wrestling or something, right? So, um, really, I just think the decision around the game matters so less. Because if you give Jadong the win, that's unfair to Flash. And if you give the regain, then it's unfair to Jadong, because Jadong was doing a weird build, and now it's totally revealed. Pfft, it's all horrible and stuff. So, really, I just hate NBC. I think that's the best way to put it. I think Jadong and Flash are um, very good players, and no matter what the outcome would have been, there's always going to be an asterisk next to that title, you know. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so enough of enough of the sad stuff. Uh, you know, congrats to Jadong. You know, I'm always happy when Jadong wins. Always happy when Flash wins. So no big deal. So here's some shameless plugging. Everyone should read Bone. I've been reading this graphic novel. This is so good. It is, like, the best graphic novel for any age. So to my six-year-old viewers, you can totally read this if you're the kind of person who likes to restrain himself to only appropriate reading material. Bone is awesome. It's so good. Everyone should read Bone. Um... So yeah, I've been going for about four minutes now. That's about the time at which I transition straight on in hmm, to the game, the game discussioning. We're watching Haya vs. Jongbi in the recent um, Hwasung Oz vs. Samsung Khan Pro League match. And I specifically liked this match a lot because Jadong did not play. Jadong was actually in another um, match, so he was unable to be present for his team uh, playing against Samsung Khan. So it was like, oh my god, can Hua Sung actually like, come through and win? And Haya really stepped up and played incredibly well. And he's playing against Jongbi, who, as you know, is really, really good. He's been doing... He's been not getting good results as of lately, but I haven't really noticed him doing a lot of violent screw-ups, per se. I, I've always enjoyed watching his play quite a bit. And they're playing on the map Moonglaive, which I think is a really interesting map for Terran vs. Protoss, because this is kind of a weirdly shaped center. It's kind of a, it's kind of a small center, you know? It's not like Python, where you know, it, it feels like this giant, wide-open space. I mean, it's... 
It has a little bit of circularness to it, thanks to this little, little ledge sitting right here. But these these high ground areas, you know, these ramps going down here, we're going to see Jongbi spawn here, and we're going to see Haya at the top. These ramps just screw everything up for the defender. Because if you have a push, and you manage to just reach your opponent's base, uh, and just set up right around here, it's suddenly it's like impossible to break it. Protoss has to be very active about flooding a lot of units down and around, just to make sure he can flank from appropriate angles. Other than, other than that, uh, the map is relatively normal. I think that there are... Um, I mean, most of the options that I can think of for Protoss, I mean, 13 Nexus or 12 Nexus, or however you like to build your early Nexus, um, I, I don't particularly like those on this map, just because if the Terran opts for some two-factory, he can set up here and push in really well. Um, or, you know, even earlier than that, he can just kill this off, because there's only three start positions, and the start positions are kind of nearby. Um, they feel closer by than on most maps. Um, so yeah, I think... Protosses really should opt for something relatively safe. Um, what, what's pretty nice is that there's so many expansions around this ring um, that Protoss does have the opportunity to expand around quite a bit. They will like to take the other main. Um, I will say, though, that if you lose control of the center, if you lose any mobility, your expansions are going to start falling very quickly. So we see a lot of um, good cut-ins on this map. And what I mean by that is the Terran player will push up, cut into um, an area that's between... Uh, expansions. So for instance, the Terran will cut in right here because there's a set of expansions here and a set of expansions here. And by cutting in between these, he can push these very easily with small amounts of units and eliminate them. Terran does have a pretty nice opportunity to turtle because this expansion recently has gotten an extra gas. Ooh, very fancy. It used to just be minerals and everyone thought that was unfair because who doesn't like more gas, right? So they added on an extra geyser here. So Terran can do a lot of stuff where they push early and if it fails, they turtle up hard and they even have this nice little back door um, entrance to where they can do nice little tank positionings and sort of wall this area off. So as we're going to see in this match, Jongbi does a pretty damn good job of trying to make sh maintain presence in the center and do nice little um, counterattacks, despite the fact that he does lose control of this positioning right here. So I, I suppose the big point of emphasis that everyone should be thinking about is this area right here, right outside Protoss's front. How is Terran going to go about... Um, you know, exerting his influence there. So now we do have the uh, game nice and loaded up. Oh, commentators are making funny noises at each other. Oh, how fantastic. So that is a sign that's Korean. They want people to be fighting and they want something to be done with an exclamation point with great force. But of course, we just like focusing on the game. This sort of wall in, I like a lot. <laughs> I mean, it might seem weird. A lot of players like walling in this way, but I mean, think about what's nice about this. Um, first of all, uh, you're going to be putting the supply depot here, and notice how there's not a lot of attacking space for like zealots or dragoons, but there's a lot of repairing space along the backside. Also, if dragoons do manage to get up, when they're retreating, um, for instance, when the tank comes out, they have to go back up like this and then down. If you were just doing a straight wall off here, they would just kind of get to go joink, or they might even be... Um, halfway down the ramp to begin with, so you do tend to get a few extra shots off. Something of slight concern um, to note. And, uh, you know, this isn't something that should cause you not to wall in, but it's something that you should be aware of in case it does, uh, you know, turn out to be a problem, is the fact that this might constrict movement um, if your opponent begins recalling you in the later stages of the game, if you end up walling this off. Um, that is something to think about, because a lot of players will think just of the early game. You know, for instance, a, a Terran player will be watching this game with Haya, and they'll say, oh, that's a cool wall off, I'm going to do that. And then they'll play more and more and more, and then, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes into the game, they'll start experiencing a lot of recalls. And um, they'll only think of things that happen within a two or three minute range around that as the possible solutions for this problem. You know, they'll say, well, you know, should I really be taking my fourth here or my fifth here? Should I really be adding on these two factories here? And I, I want to make sure that everyone's aware of this little wall off at the front, constricting movement in the late game, because sometimes it's really useful to come that far back in the game and consider those sorts of adjustments to make. See, so yeah, look at big repairing space. Very awesome. Excellent. Fantastic. Nifty. Nifty. Hi, y'all doing everything nice and normal. Now, if you're Protoss, you have seen now your opponent has one guy in gas. Almost always, that's going to indicate some sort of faster command center. 
And um, honestly, if any of you like going fast command center, um, do take two guys off gas. You really don't need that much gas to get the fast command center. You really are a little bit um, shorter on the minerals in order to get the uh, you know the tank and the siege. But you know, right when the factory finishes, all you really need to do is get the machine shop. Then you can start tossing guys back in as the guys are. Everything is as normal as can be. And um, I also want to say that this green tea I got, you know, green tea normally kind of has this um, slight brownish hue to it. It's a very sort of faded color. But I just got this, like, Costco pack of, like, you know, 100 tea bags. And it makes it this bright neon. It looks like someone dropped a green highlighter in here. It is, like, the most alien bright looking color. But it's really good, so I'm going to keep drinking it. So here's the first thing I absolutely love by Zhangbi. He is building his robotics facility here, and we're going to see him get the Robo um, Support Bay right there. So let's come back to the map and look at this. Um, very normal sort of thing that you're doing in Terran vs. Protoss is just walling off areas you don't want movement, right? So for instance, this main here, I'm just going to wall off stuff at the ramp, so that way Vultures can't get up. I'm going to put a cannon behind here and a cannon in the main, and that's, that's the end of that expansion. I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, or likewise, when someone's taking his third here, they're going to go ahead and wall this area off. But what I love so much is this sort of planning here, because um, what almost certainly happens, and what we're seeing right now um, from Jongbi is that he's going for um, a reaver before he ends up taking his expansion, uh, if I recall correctly. So this probably means he's going to be taking this expo and this expo with slightly, uh, probably a smaller army or at a slightly awkward time. So probably in some of his practice matches, he had Vulture Harass early on being a really big problem. And look at how early he's solving this problem. He planned very early to send that pile on there. And that, I think, is an excellent, excellent, excellent sort of maneuver. Um, uh, for a Zerg player, think of the problems you're having in the mid-game, and think if you can send an Overlord out super, super early. Sometimes you'll see players send their Overlords in the weirdest patterns, and only much, much later into the game will it become clear as to why that was useful. And, yeah, again, uh, just think as early as possible in terms of solving problems, and think about stuff you're going to build anyways. I mean, Zhangbi's going to be building this robotics facility, this support bay. He's going to be building that pylon anyways. So there's no reason not to build it right here, in an area that he would normally be walling off with pylons. Because, I mean, think about the double advantage you get. First of all, you get the advantage I've said, you know, a million times in the last two minutes, which is you've walled this area off. But the second thing is that potentially, potentially, our Terran opponent will be surprised by this reaver drop. It gets, you know, that benefit of the hidden reaver without actually being in a particularly vulnerable location. I mean, if you tr are trying to, you know, hide it up here, and you're trying to hide your robo bay over here, these are very clearly funky, vulnerable locations. Or in Heartbreak Ridge, when you see um, Protosses build their robo bay at, you know, the, the far top left or bottom right corner. And that's, that's neat. You know, it's, it's occasionally good to do surprises. But notice that this is a potential surprise. We have the benefit of maybe being surprising, but if not, we're still just going to go ahead and do some normal harassment anyways. And as usual, everything's going fine and dandy for uh, Haya. Making sure he's getting that engineering base super early. I mean, this is the most standard way to early expand possible. Just one factory, siege expand. And the critical component of it, the one I think that really glues it all together and makes it work, is getting that en early engineering bay to get the turrets up. You know, you, you keep um, the observers out a little bit. Uh, but more importantly, you deal with drop and uh, dark templar very, very well. One thing to note, let me just bring up the map, just so this is a little bit larger. Um, so here is where Terran's main is. Sometimes it's very useful to think of where you're positioning the turrets relative to where you're going to build all your extra factories. Because Terran will naturally, uh, you know, begin with maybe one factory, maybe get a second one kind of soon after they take the expansion. But then they sort of stay on one or two a lot of times, and then they flood suddenly with four, five, six factories total. So um, Flash, if you watch a lot of his games, is very good at doing a very minimalist positioning of his turrets, right? Something Flash would do um, is he puts one here, at this expansion, then one right about here at his ramp, and then one here at this right side of his minerals, and then he would plan on building his factories right up here. I've never actually seen him do that on this map, but he has definitely done this on uh, Fighting Spirit. I've seen him do this on Heartbreak Ridge. And we're seeing Haya do a little bit of that. He has one turret here, one here, and one here. It creates a nice little nest for him to construct future factories. 
Um, I don't think that Haya actually ends up using that little nest he's created this game. I think he does uh, go ahead and just build factories in an area that Jongvi can easily scout it with his uh, observers. But I still think it's very useful to bring up because um, a lot of players just get in the habit of building their turrets in locations that seem useful, and then they just build their factories wherever they can fit them. And just... Mm, excuse me, sorry, the tea in my banana is coming back up. Mm. There we go, sorry. Sorry, I just inadvertently almost vomited right here on the cast. But anyways, so um, a lot of players will just build the factories where they can fit them. But I mean, it, notice right here, this zealot is already seeing that extra factory get built. Any little extra thing you can hide is a nice advantage. So what we're going to see about uh, Jangvi's harass right here is that he's not going straight for the um, the minerals. I think this is a really important the way that he's doing this harassment because um, notice that he went for the reavers before he took his expansion. A lot of players treat it as a cheese. When they are doing what Jongvi's doing, they think, man, I really better kill off a whole bunch of SCVs or else I'm screwed, right? Well, not necessarily. Jongvi's doing a very good job just poking in here, and really he's just killed off um, tanks and done damage to the units. And now we're seeing another tactic that's essential um, for strong, sort of um, fast Reaver play, which is this stuff with the Dragoons. A lot of the tanks are committed into the main, and so if you can run up like this, you can do a whole bunch of damage. Uh, I, I, I don't quite like the way that this turned out. I mean, we pretty much have one, almost two dead Dragoons. But, um, you know, still, it's, it's a good little tactic to think about. Now, let's pause right here. Everything that Jongbi's doing is great, right? He opened up with Reavers. He, um, you know, he's expanding once and now expanding twice. This is actually a relatively safe way to play because we do have the benefit of the Reavers to hold off mid-game pushes. But let's, if you can look at the mini-map right here, I'll actually wait till this cursor moves away. Oh, great, they clicked on it. Still one gateway, right? Just one gateway. That means that we're going to have not so many Dragoons as Jongbi. So here, you know, some of our early Dragoons, we don't really need too many to, to be able to put a lot of pressure on at the front. And uh, unfortunately, this pressure didn't go so well, so there's the Reaver. But look at this. Now we're starting to see why this was built so early on. It's so Jongbi can take this expansion really, really early on, very smoothly in his play. And also, again, the added benefits of the surprise and the added benefits of the um, proximity to his opponent. But, you know, other than that, I mean, it's, it's still excellent, excellent timing. And look, despite the fact that Jongbi has been stuck on one gateway for so long, he has enough units to block everything he needs to. So now we've done a lot of early game discussion, let's move right on into the mid game. We're seeing um, extra refinery being added on there, and here is the factory flood, right? Uh, that was some delicious sip of tea right there. So this factory was added on not so long ago. Notice the observer can see all of this. Um, and again, I'm not saying spend a whole bunch of extra money on turrets, so that way the observers don't get in. I'm saying, uh, using the money that you would spend on the turrets anyways, think if there is some positioning of these turrets such that you could maybe hide these a little bit longer. So this is looking like a relatively fast push from Protoss. <laughs> Let me try that again. This looks like a relatively fast push from Terran. Protoss, uh, unfortunately, kind of has to sack control of that high ground area. This is the one thing I would be concerned about, is that we don't really have good control over this region. You need a lot of Dragoons and Observers to do that, though. So, um, I'm not saying Jongbi needs to move up to the, the center of the map. There's Stork. Uh, Stork's just, you know, looking confused. Great! Right back to the game. Yeah, I'm not saying Jongbi should take those five Dragoons and move up to the center of the map. Instead, what I'm saying is that his build sort of forces him not to go up to the center of the map, which is something pretty important to consider. So that's why we're seeing this Reaver do a lot of movement around there. Uh, this is fantastic. I really like this. Assuming you have an Observer leading in front to spot. But just keeping the uh, Reavers right there... A lot of Terran players will start slowly stockpiling tanks, and then out of their factories that don't have add-on, they'll do harassment with vultures, and then they'll upgrade. Um, they'll do upgrades. They will um, uh, you know, be preparing to ex expand to a third, and they'll just be doing vulture harass in the meantime to kind of keep Protoss down. And that's what that, why I love that reaver positioning so much, is it just gets in the way, you know, because it's really annoying when you're like, all right, go vultures. I mean, they should come out, and there's like two little blue glowing orbs going right for their foreheads. So, you know, nice little strong technique. And one thing I also want to point out right now, this is, this is the sort of subtlety that you should all consider implementing in your play. Notice right here 
Not long ago, I saw this gas mining. I didn't say anything. I'll actually rewind um, a little bit here. Um, yeah, I guess I rewound not enough. But um, right now, uh, I've just rewound about a minute. Uh, this is when I was talking about moving the Dragoons into the center of the map, and this is where we awkwardly stared at Stork for uh, an unusually long amount of time. That's right, that's definitely Stork. That is indeed Stork. Fantastic. Okay, so as we're going to click around here, we're going to look at some of these factories. At least I think it was here. Um, when we looked at the expansion of Haya, he was mining gas. So when I saw that, I kind of said to myself, huh, I guess he is, um, you know, planning on doing some sort of... You know, I didn't rewind fast enough. I'll just, you know, cut to me. <laughs> so I, we looked at Haya's expansion. We saw gas mining there, and it was... It was, it was timed such that I thought, oh, he's probably going to be getting some sort of, you know, upgrades. He's, he definitely can't spend all that gas he's getting. He's going to be stockpiling it unless he does something like text to a starport, text to a science facility, gets upgrades, these sorts of things. But what I love right now, this is, this is a subtlety I was referring to earlier, is that Haya has actually pulled those guys out of gas. They are no longer mining from gas. So let's actually go to the expansion. We're going to go there in just a sec. Yeah, look at that. Nothing mining gas right here. In other words, what Haya did is he um, he did the usual one factory early expand. Then he built a refinery at his expansion, got a bunch of extra gas so he could build more factories, and then pulled them right out of gas again. So that way he can start being really, 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 really aggressive, get as many minerals as he can to begin this push. Because honestly, one geyser supports two factories constantly producing tanks. You'll need the extra gas if you want to get upgrades, if you want to um, get siege and mines and all this other stuff to get more factories. But with just one refinery, you can support two factories constantly producing tanks. So what it looks like Hayao is doing is gearing up for a beautifully done mid-game timing push. And that is one thing I love so much about the way that Haya did this. He basically um, said, "Ah, you know, I, I had the timing about right of this with this push, but I just need like 200 extra gas here." So he just got a refinery, mined like 200 extra gas, and then just pulled them right out of the refinery again. So now he's starting this really awesome push. And this is um, this look for a timing push is is right on the money. You know, like some number of tanks and not too many vultures because you're going to be flooding with vultures. You're going to be making vultures almost exclusively out of all your various um, all your various factory. Um, the, the barracks is being floated to help spot for anything you know being positioned right here. And I think these two vultures right here on the mini-map, we saw them take this path. They actually wandered all the way around here and up like this. And I think these are going to be planting mines here. Whether he does end up planting mines with those or not, I still think it's useful to, to see that he did that. Um, to say, oh, hey, you know, maybe uh, when I'm doing this sort of mid-game push, I might have some troubles with him reinforcing. So why not just send out two vultures super early? Yeah, look at that. That's so beautiful. I absolutely love that. And yeah, so here's the push coming out. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. But focus on these vultures. Look, already took out a Dragoon. Beautiful. Look at this. These Dragoons should have been ideally running up to about here right now. But they can't because these mines got in the way. So they kind of had to hang out or take a bunch of losses. So notice Terran is pushing like this. He's pushing up here. He just wants to have this nice wall here. And notice that um, this is a pretty hard area to attack and kind of thanks to this little bump there. So he scoots out along the top, and now he's going to start pushing forward to the key period. Again, the, the, the key positioning right here is this, is this region right here, because um, not only does it create a good attacking point to go into here or to go into here, but it cuts Protoss completely from moving into the center of the map. That's why this is so critical. It means that if Protoss wants the center of the map, he has to attack uphill. And um, it most of the time won't be able to do that, so that means Protoss is going to be ferrying a lot of units behind this little thin ridge, which you know Protoss very much so does not want to do. Some great positioning here. And look, there is the Vulture Flood. Look, the Vultures are what allow the push to move forward aggressively. Uh, the tanks are what allow the push to um, exist in the first place. They're kind of the sticking power, the muscle of the push. But, um, you know, to continue my stupid analogy, um, the, the vultures are like the tendons that allow the muscle of the tanks to do what they want to do. Oh, man. 
I should have a script written so that way I can say such brilliant things every time I'm in a cast. Mm. And the aggressive push continuing. And this, is, I think, is typical, the, what, this look of the mid-game push, um, in that you kind of sprint to a location... And then you push from this location with Siege slowly over until you get to where you want to be. And um, I think that this location where you begin the push from is a pretty underrated concept. It's actually not something that people really discuss too much. Um, it's actually really common in all matchups. Just getting a little bit of control or being able to freely move to a location is so beneficial. I mean, in Zerg vs. Terran, I mean, the Zerg player controls key um, pieces of land with lurkers and lings. So that way, when the Zerg gets defilers, he can walk his defilers up to that location and then swarm from that location into the Terran's base instead of having to swarm from the Zerg's natural all the way to the Terran's natural. And we're seeing the same thing right here on this map, right? Protoss... Normally, you know, if a lot of players will start sieging up right here, you know, right uh, as they get to their high ground area right here, and then they'll start slowly sieging forward. But Hayo is able to cut 10, 15, 20 seconds off his push by beginning it up here. And I think a lot of that is thanks to these vultures that wiggled around here and then got right here. Because look at how deadly this is. Look at how much... Look at the danger that we're dealing with now as Protoss. And honestly, if Protoss had maybe an extra production cycle worth of units, if there was an extra control group of Dragoons, there was an extra control group of um, Zealots, I think that... Ah! What did I just hit? I accidentally opened up some channel, so hopefully it will reload. Oh my god! Alright, so we did end up um, rewinding just a little bit. And, uh, oh my god, let me upgrade this to the high quality. Oh yes, because I do value you, my viewers. Yeah, We're watching in 480p, which for those of you who know things about technology, bigger numbers and um, cooler letters always mean better technology. Um, so yeah, and this is the thing that I started to really be like, wow, this is really nice by Jongbi, because the game still has 10 minutes to go. So I was very impressed at the fact that Jongbi just didn't lose here. I would lose here 100% of the time, guarantee it, uh, with Haya doing this push. But Jongbi's moving around here, brilliant job to try to pick some of this stuff off. He's no, he knows that these Dragoons are his only you know, tool to maintain any sort of presence in the middle. So there's a very disappointed coach. Mrr. And these Dragoons doing quite a bit of damage with the Observer there. And this is like the super danger push here. Oh, the Reavers didn't fire because Reavers are related to Dragoons, which just pretty much never do anything they're supposed to do. Um, but this is really great, right? This sort of thing. So two things to mention here. Um, by moving this far forward, same idea about where you're pushing from, right? If the Protoss just tries to control right here, the Terran can walk up here and then doesn't have to travel that far to regain the push. But if Protoss can control all the way up to here, Terran really has to push back just to even get a chance to connect with his center push. So moving really aggressively forward. Forcing those tanks to siege. That is huge, forcing those tanks to siege. Um, another way to say it is it's forcing those tanks to be immobile. Jongbi being, being very patient. We don't see any probes being produced here. Just full all-out units and a nice little um, attack here. I really think that these Dragoons could have been, you know, a little bit more useful here. But the Reavers coming in, and this is one thing that's incredibly beneficial about early game Reavers, is the fact that you can do this sort of stuff with the push. I think that Reaver shot could have been helped tremendously um, if it would have been target fired, but... I mean, look look at how well Jongbi held off that push. I think that is a very impressive push by Haya, and I think it's a very impressive um, response by Jongbi. But of course, Jongbi had been delaying for so long, he had been forcing Haya to sort of hold back with all um, his additional tanks and vultures. So now that you know Haya has a little bit more freedom to get to here, we're going to see you know all those units that Haya wasn't able to reinforce with earlier now suddenly being able to flood forward. So this is this is pretty aggressive. This isn't you know like a nice standard push. This is you know trying to exploit um, some sort of positional. Um, little thing. I, I, I wasn't too big of a fan of this when I saw it live. Um, yeah, I mean, just that's a lot of units that are just sort of like down the tube. But still, let's think about what that push accomplished. First of all, it almost won. But we also have this expansion that we have um, now built right over here. So just to think about how Haya was managing his economy, 
We talked a little bit about how Haya did that cute thing where he got the refinery, mined some stuff, then pulled guys out of the refinery, and then um, made a bunch of factories, and then did the really big push. But had a bunch of guys mining minerals and just enough gas so that he could constantly produce tanks. So he's still going to be stockpiling a little bit of money because um, five factories, you end up you know just being able to get a little extra money. Six factories, you know, you end up not quite having any extra, but you know. He's going to have a little bit extra money that he's building up, so then he'll be taking this expansion at the left. And at this point, I would imagine, he's now going to start mining more gas. This is when he's going to start getting his upgrades. This is when he's going to start emphasizing more tanks. And then he's going to go into a slightly more defensive game. Um, that, I think, is one possibility. The fact that that expansion is now up on that left side, I think, is quite helpful. And again, vultures are what, allow, are what are allowing this to happen. We can plant mines everywhere. Still just five factories right now, and we haven't gotten a chance to look around Hayaz base yet. But I would sincerely hope that there's an armory at least doing something. At least spinning a little bit. So unfortunately my flash players take in a little bit of lag there, but no big deal. So the vulture is just sort of darting around. Haya still knows how important it is to have this good docking location for his push. And look, the instant that the Protoss moves in the wrong location, Terran's just sprinting forward, right? I mean, part of the reason um, that Terran's able to do this is because of this little lump right here. If you just plant a few mines here, or even more loosely, if you just plant them here, if, if Protoss moves anything around this way to threaten this expansion, you just go joink and move right in there. And these really were threatening that left expansion, and this is just an incredibly nicely timed push by Haya. I like this a lot more than that other one. But, you know... Remember when Haya, just like two minutes ago when Haya lost all these units and I said I didn't like that too much? We can still see Haya's motivation for doing this push. It secures that left expansion even more. And look at that beautiful little timing, right? He just kills that off, and now, just losing that pylon suddenly makes this a thousand times more dangerous for Zhangbi. Because any of these vultures can just swarm in at any point in time. Look at how strong this push is. Notice that that was just four tanks, and a fifth one ended up popping in the back. But very few tanks. Vultures really allow for aggressive pushes in the mid game with these sort of middle-ish to small unit counts. I love this game. It was so aggressive by the by the uh, the Terran. And this is something that also doubly impresses me about Jongbi, is that in a lot of games lately we see Terrans opting for some sort of powering, you know, some sort of oh I'm going to defend and take six bases and I'm only going to have one dropship. And if I lose it, that's okay, because all I want to do is turtle and get a 3-3, 200-200 army. But, um, you know, so a lot of Protosses are super good at holding that off. And we've seen Protosses actually kind of screw up holding off this sort of push right here. Um, if any of you watched the amazing best of three between Shuttle and Flash, um, when they were playing their game on Outsider, Flash just did a mid-game push, and Shuttle had, like, you know, his four bases set up. He had his, like, two forges upgrading. He just, you know, started his Arbiters, and he was upgrading them. And he only had, like, two gateways. So Flash just, like, moved out with a mid-game push and just killed him, like, immediately. It was, like, a hilarious game. Flash literally appeared at uh, Shuttle's front door at his natural, and Shuttle just left. He didn't even, like, attack with any units. He was just, like, whatever, you know. And so that's why I love this game that Zhang is playing so much, is he's doing an excellent response. Things to think about are how the Reaver came into play here, how he was holding back and just flooding with speed zealots and waiting for the right time to move out with this push. How he's making um, predominantly Dragoons in this low um, unit count stage. Not really too many probes being reinforced here either. Um, would like to see just slightly more observers there. You see, look at this, making predominantly Dragoons. Uh, not too much saturation on those mineral patches, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, you make slightly more Dragoons, and then you flood with Zealots. You know, you can have, you know, like maybe two control groups of Dragoons, a control group and a half of Dragoons. Um, and then you start making a ton of Zealots, and it becomes increasingly difficult um, for your Terran opponent to really just get a solid push going. And I will say, still, as Terran... Even if your um, Protoss opponent is making a lot of Dragoons, it is still really good with aggressive pushes to get, like, this many Vultures. A lot of players just think a little bit too simplistically, and they go, well, tanks beat Dragoons and Vultures beat Zealots. I mean, well, kind of. I mean, if you just have a few tanks in good positions and a lot of Vultures, even Dragoons are going to have an extraordinarily difficult time with it. And this is obviously really good. This was totally awesome. Um, but, you know, this little utility group of Dragoons in the middle 
plus these Reavers make these counterattacks so strong. This is why I'm so impressed with Zhangbi this game, right? He is doing all these very strong little workaround attacks with the units that he has, um, largely because he can't really expand anywhere near the bottom. He has this huge crisis at his front to deal with. But he's doing such a good job of um, just putting counter pressure on. Unfortunately, Hayo's doing a little bit um, too good of a job. Hayo's just very, very stable right here. Uh, they're pointing out that there are no turrets here. Like, oh man, maybe if you got a reaver drop off, you win the game. He'd actually get the reaver drop off, kill some SCVs, and then get pushed at his front and lose the game. Be real careful with that reaver and make sure it's in good places. Again, the reaver is a strong unit for Protoss, so you should use it just to kill off enemy pushes and to just do damage. You don't necessarily have to just go non-stop for, um, for workers. So think a little bit about what Hyde is doing right now. He started to try to solidify this push up here, but really we're seeing more and more that his goal is just to get this expansion up, and once this starts getting a little flimsy here, he just pulls all of his units back. I mean, look at all these purple units. There's almost no units there. That's actually mostly mines. Oh, that little purple blob on the mini-map there. And Haya doing the lift. Ooh, a nice little shot getting off there. And this is one thing that I suppose is a little bit unfortunate um, for Zhangbi in terms of the positioning on this map. The fact that, you know, Haya is pretty close to his opponent. And, um, you know, Haya gets to expand away from Zhangbi. So, you know, that's a little unfortunate. Still really nice little action with the Reaver there. Didn't get that shot off. That would have just eliminated these two tanks, like, immediately. I mean, that's what Zhangbi should have done, just like, a little bit earlier. So, right now, um, to, to sort of recap, I think it's pretty clear that Haya is getting a um, pretty solid advantage going on here. So, Haya had this very nice mid-game push that, even though Zhangbi broke it, Haya still knew the key positions to put pressure on in order to get this left expansion up. If Haya had not gotten this left expansion up um, at any point in time, then I really think Zhangbi would be in a good position to win. I think that that's the key difference between, um, you know, a strong level pro gamer like this and, you know, the, the C plus, B minus level Terran who's using this exact same push as Haya. <gasps> Get it! All right, well, poor little Scarabs, the dumbest units in the world. <laughs> oh, the Wraith. Whoops. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, if for some reason Haya had not gotten this thing up, he'd probably in a, be in a losing p position. And what I was saying earlier is that that's the key difference between, like, a C-plus level Terran and then this very strong level pro gamer Terran, is that that push, yeah, it did the damage and it may have killed the opponent, but its purpose was really to get this expansion up. A lot of times uh, you'll see players do this push, and another good thing to do is to swing around back with a dropship and really spread the units thin so then you can get in with the push. All these tactics are fine, but it's important that... Um, you have some follow-through plan, because a lot of players who I watch play um, in these lower-level Terran Griff Protosses just add on, like, a sixth factory, or if they've been macroing poorly, a seventh factory, and they just try to pound the Protoss's front down, and if, you know, you're playing against someone like Jongbi, who's incredibly good at defense, and really good with using these Reavers, it's just not going to go so well. So we're seeing Protoss still try to do good jobs of, like, swinging around, and we note that... Um, Protoss is doing more stuff swinging around the bottom side of the map, so he just pretty much sacked this top right expo and just went for one at the bottom. The bottom one's going to be much easier to defend because Zhangbi has all his units swinging around in that direction anyways. Unfortunately, there's just a few too many vultures here just taking tons of hits, absorbing all the damage, because Dragoons don't really do all that much damage against uh, vultures. Or should I say, they don't really do all that much damage against vultures. Especially when there's like a bunch of tanks just like killing the shit out of them. So really only four tanks, not that many tanks. Really cool, highly aggressive unit compositions from Haya. Here comes the big vulture flood. Whoa! And yet more vultures come in. Look at this. Zell's coming in doing a nice little job, but there's just too many vultures, right? Like, see, they're going to eat through these... Um, Zealots and the Vultures, you'll note, did a very good job of target firing those Zealots. Cool stuff to see. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm not sure who his hairstylist was, but I want it, man. I want. I just want it to look like my hair was just like waxed, like seriously, just sculpted right out of clay on my forehead. Yes, sir. 
and continuing to do these nice little pressure counterattacks here. And um, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it at this stage. I mean, this push up at the top right is kind of gone. I think that um, Zhangbi feels as though he can't really um, get in a good position unless he does a ton of damage to that economy over there at the left. So these tanks slowly pushing forward. Nice job by Haya, just sort of poking in there with his units that are there. Uh, I would have ideally liked him to be moving to the right when Zhangbi was attacking that expansion at the left, just because Zhangbi's focus will be split. Oh my god, the vultures coming in. Look at that. That's, that, that to me is hilarious. The fact that, you know, the tanks were, weren't really being paid attention to for Zhangbi um, for too long. And then, like, the instant Zhangbi's like, oh yeah, I need to go kill him, don't I? It's like a ton of vultures flood in. Ugh. And the observer doesn't quite know where to click. If you look at the mouse down here at the bottom left, this cursor was going all over the place. Coming through here again. Rebuilding the robotics facility. Uh, this is really a good position as Protoss when you're feeling kind of cramped up like this to just get um, a storm and a shuttle with stormers in there. It, it, it means that you don't really need to get more minerals, you know, especially if you're having a hard time expanding and you can really only get gas. You pretty much just go ahead and um, get the gas, get a bunch of stormers, then you can even pull guys out of the gas geysers, and then you can use your storm to get in a slightly better position so that you can actually get away with taking a fourth. Also, storm's super good um, in these uh, middle-ish sized armies. If it's too small, they'll just sort of maneuver away. But, you know, if you have, like, you know, two control groups of units and Terran has an equivalent force and you just have, like, one shuttle with the um, with the Stormers in there, you can do quite a bit of damage. Zhangbi's doing a good job of just holding on, though. And Haya's just sort of biding his time, waiting for a good push. Still still keeping control of, of this area right here, which I think is was instrumental to his success in this game. More units being made for Zhangbi. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see that right now, without that shuttle with the Reavers, Zhongbi's starting to get in that sort of, uh, situation, you know. Shuttle with Reavers is, is very similar to the shuttle with Templar in terms of its sort of use. Shuttle with Reaver can do a little bit more stuff with going off and, you know, harassing expansions and forcing more units to be moved around. But, um, look at how much more Zhongbi is now pulling back, now that he doesn't have any shuttle with Reavers, now that he's been kind of low on units. Whoopsie-daisies. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Ugh, losing that many Dragoons was just too brutal. But, you know, just to just to recap that game, I like the way that Haya, um, let me just unmute the chat so we can take some questions. I really like the way that Haya did that cute little trick with his gas geyser early on, where he um, mined a little bit of gas, but then pulled everything out to enable him to do a push. I think that's a great example of um, rearranging everything, so that way you can um, just get a little bit uh, more out of what you want done. You can do a little bit better job of saying that, but you know, just doing something slightly um, just subtle, uh, just putting guys in and taking guys out really fast. So um, let's just go ahead and take some questions really fast. Do, 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 do. Well, as I'm waiting for them to come in, I'll go ahead and uh, just comment a little bit more on the game. And I like the way that that mid-game push was set up, where it got the left expansion. If you wanted a really super aggro push, you can add on like a 6th factory to that. Or maybe even tech to starport, you know, after you add in guys in the gas later, so you can do some dropship action. But I mean, really, just getting in a good position, like uh, Haya did, and doing just slow pushes in. And really, I mean, if we just come back and look at the game for a brief bit of time here, I mean, this is where um, the push ended up dying for Haya, but I mean, after that, I mean, not too many tanks were really getting close. The tanks were just sort of hanging out here to kill off these locations. Now, note that we're at the 13-minute mark. The tanks didn't really even start advancing forward. Look, this is the 16-minute mark, and these tanks still have not advanced in to kill off that expansion, right? The tanks were pretty static. Um, instead, Haya was using this as an advantage to sort of slowly eke in. So, let us see here... Let us take some awesome questions. So, Zerg Needs Food says, Is the standard way out of playing... Um, I'm going to mute this real fast. Is the standard way of playing Terran vs. Protoss, making a bunch of vultures to buy time, while in the meantime pumping out tanks and just keeping them positioned um, around your base? There are different styles, really. So, um, 
I mean, just to name a few styles of Terran vs. Protoss, of just the interaction of vultures and tanks, there is the, um, the Tornado Terran style, which is where you do tons of harassment with your vultures, and you stockpile as many tanks as you can. So you're doing tons of vulture harass, constantly sending out, you know, like eight vultures, four vultures, eight vultures, maybe even a dropship with vultures here and there. And so Terran's trying to, you know, or Protoss is trying to hold back and keep control of everything. And then... Um, after Protoss is finally starting to feel stable, Terran moves out and has, like, you know, a 20-tank army because he's just been stockpiling them all game long. So that's one style. Um, another one is just to do these lightning pushes where you have predominantly vultures to allow you to advance really far, far forward. There's slower pushes um, that involve vultures as, like, support units where you have, like, a control group or slightly more of vultures, but mainly tanks. The vultures are just darting anywhere they need to be to kill off zealots, and you really want the tanks to be the muscle. But those are much, much, much slower. I mean, there's a lot of variety. I think uh, a better way to put it is that um, uh, if you, you can do a lot out of just keeping tanks positioned at static locations and relying on vultures to really do extra damage here and there. I think that's a, a, a cute way to describe that. So let's see here. Um, okay, so um, Camus says, We saw in previous matches on Heartbreak Ridge as well as in Ultimatum, that Flash used Supply Depots to make um, his own wall outside of his natural. Could Haya use this tactic offensively to make a wall outside of Jangbi's natural to turn away the first or to turn the first push into a much stronger contain? And why don't we see Ter um, Ter Terran using buildings as walls more and pushes in general? Um, hmm. I really. To answer your question of why don't Terrans use buildings uh, as walls more and pushes in general, I think the answer to that is that uh, Terrans have been doing much faster pushes as of late, and the buildings are great. I mean, I, I cannot argue that the buildings will help the strength of the push. Um, but it kind of commits, in a certain sense, you're kind of committed to defending those units. Because I've seen a lot of players who have supply depots all over the middle, and then they go and they do a big push, they have to advance like much far, farther ahead, and they end up losing those units. And then they end up losing, like, eight more supply depots in the middle of the map, you know, and that's kind of awkward to deal with. Um, so I think it's mainly just because of the speed of the push, because predominantly we see two styles of pushing for Terran. One is the, I'm holding back with a huge army and turtling really hard until I rush forward into your face really quickly. Um, so again, there's that rush forward, or just a very fast mid-game push like we see Haya doing right now. I do think that um, there could have been some sort of contain, some sort of offensive supply depot placement with this push to make it a little bit stronger, because Flash did a great job um, just crushing Bess on ultimatum with that. Um, so actually, to come back to the game, I think that right around here, I think that you know if, if Terran actually pulls back, and just kind of hangs out up here, he might be able to do a contain. What I think would make it a little bit... Um, what, what, what steers me against p building too many buildings here is obviously it costs a lot of money to devote to a push right here. Uh, it costs a lot of money with supply depots. And our opponent already has a third up here that he can defend pretty easily by wandering guys up this alley. So if we did build a lot of stuff here, we're not really containing our opponent too much. A Protoss on three base is a pretty happy Protoss, especially against a Terran on two base. So um, I think on something like Ultimating, where you can actually contain them to two base, or um, a really great example is um, Sin Pioneer Period, or Cultivation Period, as it's more commonly known. That is a great map, you know, where you can do fancy stuff with buildings. Um, but in general, I only really like using buildings for slow pushes. That's probably the, the, the best way to describe it. Do, 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 do. So, let's see here. So, Jay says, When exactly does the Terran player know when to move out with that mid-game push? So that, honestly, is the hardest question for Terran in, in mid-game pushes. Because, you know, it's kind of nice with, you know, Flash's amazing 2-1 push style, you know, where he gets, like, to 150 food, and then right as the plus 2 attack, plus 1 armor upgrade finishes, he moves out with a big force. What's great about that is that it times itself, as I'd put it. You know, it you get the um, plus 2 attack upgrade, and right as you get that, you just go attack, and you're like, okay, this is the right timing because I know it. With some of these mid-game pushes, it's kind of weird, because you're just sitting there, and you suddenly just move out, you know. What I would say is that it takes a lot of practice, but what's fortunate is that mid-game or mid-game pushes is a technique that you can use deliberate practice um, very easily in. So 
what I mean by deliberate practice, is that you don't just say, I'm going to try to figure out when to push in this game and I'll get a feel for it. Instead, what you do is you say, I'm going to push right when I hit 60 food, or right when my gas geyser says 3,500 gas, or um, right when I see my opponent, oh, let's not base it on the opponent, you know, right when my expansion mineral patch gets this, or right when my academy finishes. You know, you create these timings for yourself. But let's begin with the food one. I'm going to push right when I'm at 60 food. So you do that push, and it gets crushed. And you say, okay, I didn't have enough units. I'm going to push right at 70 food. So you start to have a little bit more success. And then you say, okay, well, let me keep adjusting. Let me say right when I'm at 80 food. And then you have a huge amount of success with it. And you're like, oh, awesome, you know. And then as you're playing more, suddenly you end up with a, um, a guy who's doing Reaver Harass and he kills off like two tanks in your main and he starts killing off some SCVs. And in your head you said, I wanted to push at 80 food. Um, what you should say then is you should make sure you have a planned adjustment. Like, okay, I got harassed and I lost some tanks, so I'm still going to push at 80 food um, even though I got harassed. And you see how that works, and let's say it works horribly. So then what you do is you say, okay, well, I'm going to push now at 90 food after my harassment. And that doesn't seem to work so well either. So then you say, well, let me actually um, not push after this location. Let me base it off the number of tanks. Once you set these numbers for yourself and you start adjusting them up and down, when you get to more and more unorthodox situations, you get a good feel for it. Um, so the sort of feels that people have developed over time is, for instance, if I kill a Reaver, um, not even just the shuttle and the Reaver, but just the Reaver, that's generally a good time to push. Um, as long as I have like three factories or more being produced. If he does any sort of early Reaver harass, like if Haya had killed off that early um, Reaver, you can pretty much just push then. Or, you know, if your opponent, um, let's say, is doing a very, very delayed third. A lot of times um, you'll see players who are very good at timing their attack based upon um, when that third base is built for their opponent. So that's how you slowly get more and more freeform. I obviously cannot say when exactly the Terran knows when to push out, but instead what I'm doing is describing the methodology of how to have 10 different timings of when to push out in 10 different situations, all of which are correct. So I, I always think that mid-game attack timings are, are interesting points of discussion. So let's see here. Let's see here. Do 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 do. Okay, so um, four years strong says why was Jongbi exploring towards the Terran main and not at the bottom expansions? Wouldn't it have been more safe? Um, well, part of it is that he had already set up this nice little um, contain, you know, or this nice little block off with his uh, vultures. Oh, let me try it again. He set up a nice little contain with his pylon and his robotics facility and his support bay and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that expansion was already adequately defended. Um, another thing to note, though, is it's actually a little dangerous to take an expansion that's not that. Like, let's go over and look at the map right now. So the question is, why are we expanding here towards our opponent instead of expanding down here? The issue is... Um, when we expand here, we have this nice little path that we can just wander up and down like this, right? We can sort of dart uh, along this way to bounce between these bases. But if we're here, notice that when Terran cuts in here, that he has an easy push here. I mean, Terran doesn't even need to go onto the low ground. Terran can just position at the high ground, send a tank and three vultures here, and just demolish this expansion, completely annihilate it. This, I actually think, is a little bit safer. I mean... Unfortunately, I, I can't say that, oh yeah, it's the best place to expand to on the map, because obviously it has its dits advantages, but that's what I think is interesting about Moonglaive as a map, is that um, you have these uh, positions where you can get cut off really sharply, just because of the fact that it's this low ground um, outer ring and this high ground center. So you know what? That is going to wrap up Day 9 Daily number 54. Um, we're going to be doing a whole bunch more games this week. I'm going to have five more Day 9 dailies. As usual, everything is very standard. Uh, because you know Day 9, he is never, ever late. Once again, I apologize about episodes 51 and 52. Um, those got erased. That was my fault. I set up the recording with an auto-upload feature, but I was out of capacity. I was out of storage space because I was using my full 10 gigs, so it just sort of got thrown away. But, but that is okay because there are still 54 other... Day 9 dailies for you to enjoy and watch, and there'll be plenty more this week. So remember, read Bone and send an angry letter to NBC. Thanks, everyone, and cheers.